Well, with possibly being on the clip of World War III, many people are wondering about Armageddon. Are we on the verge of Armageddon? Well, today I want to share with you some thoughts about Armageddon that you probably have never heard, but it's good news. Welcome back to the Faith of the Fathers podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gessler, here to reignite the faith of the fathers. And I want to talk today about Armageddon. This is an interesting thing to talk about because, um, honestly, I've never wanted to talk about the subject. I never liked when other people talked about it because I found it completely annoying. Not because I found it fearful. I mean, yes, uh, if I believed, mm, ooh, I'm saying that, if I believed it the way that people teach it, it would be fearful, but I don't. And I want to tell you today that I don't believe the Bible teaches what many people believe about Armageddon. So what is Armageddon? First, I want to say to you, because some of you already think I'm a heretic heretic because of what I just said, but uh, we have a strong predisposition or prejudice toward the things that we already believe before we read the Bible. Uh, that those things seem more true to us than what we read in the Scriptures. And so we read into the Scriptures many times things that we already believe rather than reading what's actually there. And I find this ironic because I've had so many um, people, you know, arguing with me over over the question of whether or not Christians can have demons. And I've had people say that uh, the teaching parts of the Bible are— Romans to Jude, or uh, and so that there's nothing in the teaching portion of the Bible to say that we should cast out demons. So basically, uh, isolating Acts and the Gospels and saying those are not the teaching uh, parts of the Bible. Therefore, the Bible doesn't say that we should cast out demons. I had another person say that uh, it only talks about casting out demons in the four Gospels and a little bit of the Acts and nowhere in the rest of the Bible. So um, and that. Even in the Gospels, it's only mostly in the Synoptic Gospels, mostly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, so it's not it's t- trying to relegate that command of Jesus, and it is a command of Jesus to his disciples. And not, if you went to Sunday school, you know that I am one of them, and so are you. Uh, that we want to relegate that and say, oh, no, no, that's not for today. But something like Armageddon, which actually isn't found in the Bible, the way people talk about it. We think uh, th- that they hold to firmly, and if you question it, you're a heretic. So, um, oh well, here we go. Um, Armageddon. What is Armageddon? Okay, for most people, Christians and non-Christians alike, we think about this, and that should be um, uh, something, a tip-off for us about where this is going or where this comes from is that both Christians and non-Christians are fascinated with this topic, kind of in the same way people are fascinated with horror films. Um, it is Armageddon is this clash of the powers of evil. Um, with It's kind of a clash of evil and light. Uh, and when many people imagine that right now, like with the development of AI, uh, the possible World War III that uh, we're going to, we're creating super soldiers, you know, connecting humans to computers who have been programmed to do all this kind of evil, that evil is rising and rising and rising to this point where a great clash is going to happen and there's going to be between good and evil and the world is going to be burned up. And for many Christians, their hope is in the rapture. And I want to point out to you many problems with that right now. And and the total uh, message of today is good news, and it is a challenge for us to turn away from fear, turn away from looking to escape, and turning toward our calling as Christians. So this is a very important message today. But many of us have this idea, and it's very concrete in our minds, that Armageddon is a a war that's had, uh, that's in the future and that the Bible speaks about it. Let me tell you right now, the Bible does not speak about a great war in any concrete way that people think about it today. There are um, kind of cryptic references to the Valley of Megiddo or to Armageddon, Revelation, which is full of imagery that when people try to uh, claim that they can... Um, 
very concretely tell you what Revelation is about. Um, I, you just There's no reason to believe them. Revelation is full of cryptic uh, imagery that is um, not the easiest to understand, but many people take that cryptic Im- imagery and they make it concrete, and then they say this is biblical truth, that, that Armageddon is going to happen at this location, and these militaries are going to be there, and it's going to go down like this, and yet we can't take at face value Jesus's command to cast out demons. There is a problem there when we make concrete that which is abstract, and we make abstract that which is concrete. And um, so I think we've done that with Armageddon. Armageddon, uh, my main problem with this uh, concept that there is a great war ahead between the, the, the battle of um, or the forces of evil and the forces of light is that it's already happened. If we are thinking that the Armageddon is happening in the future, we have not understood what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. And that is going to uh, need to be repeated because we are not used to that. I want to just run through a list of things. Well, first, let me let me say this. The, everything in the Bible, understanding the Bible, has to do, uh, in, in order for us to get it right, we need to get the meta-narrative right, the big story right. What is the point of the Bible? What is the point of creation? Uh, where Where is this whole thing going? And the Bible is about creation. It starts with creation. Jesus is resurrected bodily. The new heavens and the new earth is at the end of the Bible. I just took you through the whole Bible. The beginning, Genesis, God creates the earth. In the middle, Jesus is raised from the dead bodily. At the end, the new heavens and the new earth are made when heaven and earth are joined together. God is about redeeming this creation. That is what he's about. He's not about burning it up. So here are... Um, seven problems with what many people believe about resurrection. First, as I already mentioned, the final battle between good and evil already took place on the cross. Jesus, the victor, was announced at the resurrection. When Jesus said, it is finished, he accomplished what God sent him to do, which is to take up his rule and reign on earth as it is in heaven. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's what he came to claim. That's what he told Pilate when Pilate said, are you a king? He said, it is as you say. That is what he came to do. He said, for this purpose I have been called. And so here Jesus is raised from the dead and he says, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Many Christians today believe that Satan rules this world. Satan was thrown down from heaven like lightning. Satan is toast. The only way that Satan still has power, and yes, this I believe is consistent with the book of Revelation, that God has given him a lease on time. He still exists. He still has power. He still has influence. And that influence comes through persuading men to give him our power. When when Satan makes a, a call, uh, tricks us, tempts us, leads us into temptation, we enter a contract with Satan and he usurps our power. He usurps our authority, which is why he makes us a target, because he is toast. He is thrown down from heaven like lightning, and that is good news. Jesus, so the first problem with Armageddon is that it's already over. Jesus already won. He already defeated the powers of darkness on the cross. We can get uh, into that more of that later. I believe we'll get into that. Number two, the popular vision of Armageddon considers darkness to be too great to overcome. Abandonment and escape are the only answer. This is really significant. When we think of Armageddon, we think of AI, we think of um, super soldiers, we think of uh, nuclear weapons, and that evil is so big that there's nothing that God can do about it except allow Satan to have this world burn the heck out of it, and salvage our souls. That's not the kind of God that we serve. That's not what resurrection is about. Resurrection is not living in heaven. Resurrection is a new body. The Apostle Paul said that he, uh, that the Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you and will also give life to your mortal bodies. You are not destined to live in an non-bodily form in a realm called heaven. You are meant and will be, if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you will be raised from the dead to live 
bodily because this creation that God made and said it is very good. He has not changed his mind. It is still very good. It's his idea. He doesn't throw it away. Satan doesn't win anything. Many Christians get upset about the language of, or, or people saying, you can have demons. They say, Satan can't possess me. We agree. Satan cannot possess you because he doesn't own anything, but he can control and dominate you if you give him space to, if you give him permission to. But you are right, those of you who say Christians can't be possessed, because Satan doesn't own anything. So why do you think he owns the world? He doesn't. He has been thrown down from heaven like lightning. And Jesus is victorious. The powers of darkness are not greater than the power of God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yes, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, but he has been, he's a neutered foe. He has already been defeated. Um, as uh, Morris Cirillo said, that we uh, fight to defeat, uh, we fight to overcome an enemy who has already been defeated. Amen. So number three, God will not lose a battle. Jesus didn't salvage a part of creation, and I just covered some of this. Jesus didn't salvage part of creation as in men's souls, mankind's souls. Jesus became Lord of heaven and earth. This place belongs to Jesus, and the devil will not have it. When Psalm 24 says that the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it, he doesn't lose that. That is his possession. Ask, the psalmist says, Ask, and I will give the nations to you. Speaking about the Messiah, the Messiah receives the nations. The nations don't get burned up. The devil doesn't get to destroy Jesus' inheritance. God will not lose what he created. This is his planet. This is his idea. He is victorious, and this place belongs to Jesus, not to the devil. Number four problem, the number four problem with Armageddon is evil has real power, but Part of its power is in convincing the church that evil is more powerful than she is, intimidating the church into flight instead of fight, and that is part of the devil's battle operations. This is huge. We have um, a generation of older Christians that are watching the news, um, that are scared of the future. You know, I have seven kids. How many people, I couldn't even tell you in my lifetime because I grew up in a big family too. How many people have said to me, Christians, non-Christians too, but plenty of Christians, innumerable Christians have said, how can you have all these kids in this day and age? They, meaning like the future is so bleak. How could you possibly be looking forward to it in hope and producing children? I'm doing what Jesus told me to do. I'm doing what the Bible says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, because I don't have a fatalistic view of the future. One of the reasons the younger generation has not embraced the gospel in many places is because what they saw in the older generation of Christians is nothing but fear. And this is why it should be alarming to us that both Christians and non-Christians are fascinated and some of them are fixated on the idea of Armageddon because Armageddon is all about fear of the future. Christians and non-Christians alike fear the future. That's what they have in common. That's why they both are fixated on Armageddon. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. This needs to be our focus This is our victory that Jesus has overcome the world. Um, And like I said, one of the the devil's most successful strategies has been to make the church feel defeated so that we don't even try. We're trying to escape. We think that, you know, actually some people celebrate the world becoming more corrupt foolishly, extremely foolishly, because they think that somehow this is going to speed up Christ's return. That is not what we're called to do. We're called to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are called to reign with Christ. And that does mean suffering. If we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. Not in the future, well, you know, yes, also in the future, but it's actually through suffering that we are reigning with him. Not because God loves suffering, but because if we believe that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth, and it's r- the worship of the nations belongs rightfully to Jesus, and that Jesus has given the earth as our inheritance, we will fight for, uh, for what is right and true in the, in the Jesus fashion of fighting. We will pray, we will sacrifice, we will speak truth to power, and 
when we suffer for that, that is how we're reigning because as we lay down our lives, we advance the gospel. As we speak the truth and love uh, at our own cost, at sacrificing ourselves, it is the same love that Jesus manifested when he said, greater love has no man this than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus overcame the world by laying down his life. We do the same. That's how we overcome the world, by laying down our lives. Um, so uh, we, uh, the, the devil has intimidate us, intimidated us into thinking we've already lost, so we're just about to escape. But no, we turn around, we face into the wind, we claim this territory for Jesus. First, we claim this territory, my person, you as an individual, my family, my region. We, um, a, we proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord in my life, in my family's life, in my region, in the world, because he's overcome the world already. So re- renounce that lie, that, that darkness is too great for the light to overcome, that the devil's in charge. It's not true. Some of you need to speak that out loud and just say, I break the lie over myself, the lie that I believe that the devil is more powerful than Jesus. I And some of you are going to say, I don't really, I, I can't say that because I don't believe that. You don't believe that in theory. You don't believe that in your creeds. I get that, obviously not. Nobody would in their right mind would say that. But you do believe it practically. You believe it by the way you live. You believe it by the fear that you exude. You believe it by the way you fear the future. And I'm not saying I'm immune to this. I've had plenty of fear in my life. And I am one of the, you know, I've definitely been guilty of looking at the news and feeling fearful about the future. But you know what I've learned to do? It drives me to prayer, to renouncing that, and just declaring God's victory over the future. Because he is victorious. Part of the a huge part of the reason we don't see um, righteousness, peace, and joy in the earth today is because the church doesn't know how to exercise the authority and dominion that she's called to. And like I said, this is one of the main problems with Armageddon. Many people are not even trying. They're not looking for it. They're actually looking in the wrong direction. They're looking to escape, leaving Satan to do what he wants with this world. What the church does not realize today is that Satan is afraid of you. Bullies are people who uh, use bravado and intimidation to try to intimidate other people into submission because they're afraid of people. Once you realize that the bully is actually afraid of you, everything changes. We as Christians live afraid of the devil. He's a bully. And we need to realize that he is scared to death of us. We don't realize that God has, in, has infused into us, he has granted to us the authority that he granted to Jesus. Jesus said, as the Father sent me into the world, so I send you, receive the Holy Spirit. The point of Jesus rising from the dead, saying all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples, is to say, go with confidence because I am with you and I grant you my authority and my power. The church does not realize how powerful she is, and Satan does not want us to. And he's using Armageddon as part of his intimidation factor to keep us from doing what God called us to do, which is to rule and reign in the world through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the love of self-sacrifice, and through prayer. So uh, another problem with Armageddon is that God created mankind to subdue the earth, not to be chased off of it. That is the command from the beginning. God made man, and he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and take authority over it. This is one of the the, um, tricks of Satan, idolatry, that God gave mankind authority. He gave to us the plants. He gave to us the animals. He gave to us the trees. He gave to us the water. He gave all of that to us. And yet, what does what do men do? We worship images of animals. We, we uh, lose our minds. We lose control over things in nature, in plants that we smoke and inhale, or we think that they're going to cleanse our house, or, you know, crystals, or smudging, or some nonsense like that. We act as if the authority is actually in the things God put under our feet. This is the trick of the devil, that he is saying, 
He's acting as if he has the authority. And as long as we believe him, it works that way. As long as we give him uh, authority over us, we will be under him. But the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. That is a, that's where you are supposed to be, with Satan underneath your feet. But for many of you today, you are underneath Satan's foot because you have believed his lies. You've given into uh, idolatry. You've given into um, you know, going to things that are not Jesus for healing, uh, for power, for cleansing, and it's put you in bondage. So thank God Jesus has come to set us free. You were not meant to be subdued. You are meant to subdue. You are not meant to be chased off the earth. You are meant to rule and reign over it. So another problem with Armageddon is that the fear, and, and a lot of these overlap, but the fear of Armageddon is a tool of the enemy, a form of witchcraft, intimidation, not the tool of God. There is no fear in Jesus because perfect love casts out fear, and the one who fears has not been perfected in love, which is 1 John four eighteen. And I And I've said this already, but Satan is using the fear of the future um, and this idea that he is more powerful that darkness is more powerful than light, that evil is more powerful than good, uh, into making us seek to run away, uh, scaring us into submission, scaring us into inaction, um, when actually he is the weak one, comparatively. Now, I'm not trying to say that Satan is weak. Satan has power. But Christ in you is more powerful than Satan. Without Jesus, you are underneath Satan's feet, because the wages of sin is death, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You cannot overcome Satan in your own, on your own. That's the good news of the gospel, is that Jesus came to claim the nations of the world. That is, you know, what what the uh, Israelite people were waiting for. They were waiting for the Son of Man who would make the uh, who would um, do what Adam failed to do: rule and reign with God's wisdom and justice. And God has done that in the person of Jesus. So finally, Satan wants you to believe that he is irresistible and impossible to overcome. Satan wants you to abandon the earth so you can so he can do what he wants with you. Uh, I'm sorry. So he could do what he wants uh, with what you leave behind. But Jesus said, I watch Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to walk on snakes and scorpions and authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you which is Luke 10, 18 through 19. And he said this particularly in the context of casting out demons. Now, I have worked with, um, I worked with the Voice of the Martyrs for many years, met many people uh, with incredible testimonies of suffering. Uh, I know a man who was hung upside down and had boiling oil poured over his feet because he wouldn't deny his faith uh, in, a, in a Muslim country, and he shared the gospel with Muslims. He was actually uh, baptizing Muslims in the middle of the night who had now professed faith in Christ. They were doing it under a bridge, and somebody got word of it, reported it to the authorities, and the two men he baptized were shot on the spot. They came up out of the water, he was arrested, and they shot them right then and there. And we might say, well, how was that uh, ruling and reigning? I know, yes, I know that there is suffering in the world, but Jesus said, and he himself said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Not, I'm going to destroy the world, mind you. He says, I have overcome the world. And this is it. In the middle of our suffering, we are victorious. And through our suffering, we are victorious. Someone said, I think, believe it was Justin Martyr, said um, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, it is... Uh, it waters the ground of revival. Um, and that is because it is being like Christ. And, um, you know, God honors covenant. He honors faithfulness. When uh, the people of God pray faithfully, the longer they pray, the more uh, faithfully and purely they pray, the greater the power. The Calvinistic worldview that many of us have grown up with has just not had any space for this kind of thing. But this is a fact that God is paying attention to our prayers. He's paying attention to our faithfulness. He's paying attention to our level of faith. And you think about it, why don't we spend 
hours praying? Why don't we spend uh, days fasting? It's because of our lack of faith in those things. We think that we're wasting time. We think we're throwing our life away. That is a lack of faith. God, the faith is the currency of heaven. And when we are faithful in covenant, when we are faithful in sacrifice, when we day in and day out worship, when we worship him when things are good and when we worship him when things are bad, the power increases. Particularly when we continue to worship when things are not going our way, the power increases. And when someone loves not their life even unto death, meaning that they have put their hope in Jesus and will not deny him no matter what, That gets heaven's attention. It's part of how we rule and reign through suffering. Jesus took up his authority, took up his power by refusing to bow to Satan. When Jesus went out into the wilderness, it says that the devil took him up on a mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, all these have been given to me and I give them to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus came to claim those kingdoms. Satan said, all this has been given to me. God didn't give it to Satan. Mankind did. When God said to mankind, uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, I give you all creation. When mankind then submitted to Satan, he took our rights over the creation. So that's why he said to Jesus, all this has been given to me. Jesus came to claim it back. The devil tried to give him a shortcut to skip the cross. And when we see Jesus in the garden, we see him agonizing with sweats of, uh, sweating blood because he knows what's ahead of him. And he pleads with God the Father saying, if there's another way, let, let me do it if there's another way. But if not, thy will be done. You know, Jesus said, if there's another way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will but your will be done. So Jesus refused to take the easy way out. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus, though in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to exploit. Some some translations say grasped. Uh, The idea is that Jesus Jesus didn't have any special advantage over us. Jesus is fully God, and he's fully man. I don't think we appreciate the fully man part. Jesus did not have any advantage over us in his miracles and the way that he exercised power. The only difference between you and me and Jesus is that Jesus didn't sin. Jesus had original authority. Jesus had uh, all that God gave to mankind, and he never gave the devil any rights to usurp his authority. The devil tried to give Jesus what we gave away um, with by saying, "If I'll give it all to you, Jesus, if you will fall down and worship me. And of course, if Jesus had done that, the whole world would have been burned up. Armageddon would have ended, as many people imagine, with the earth itself burned with fire and it just all hell would break loose. But Jesus did not give Satan, oh, he did not give away his authority as a man. The, the scriptures say, Psalm 115, 16, says that the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. God gave the earth to man. And the apostle Paul said that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So God gave this earth to us and he's not going to take it back. The person that needs to rule the earth must be a man. And that man was Jesus. Jesus, though in the form of God, though he was equal to God, did not regard equality with God a thing to exploit. So in other words, he stripped himself of all the advantages he could have had of being God and instead became fully a man, fully a man, fully man to suffer what we suffer, to endure the temptations that we we endure. He became a high priest who was tempted as every in every way as we are yet without sin the book of hebrews says he learned obedience through the things that he suffered the idea that jesus learned anything is kind of mind boggling we haven't grasped that jesus became fully 
man. We imagine him looking like man and floating maybe six inches above the earth, kind of being God everywhere, but that's not who he was. He was and is a man. The person in charge of the earth today, the person in charge of the cosmos, is a man like you and me, except that he is without sin. And because of his faithfulness, God has exalted him with the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He will never be dethroned. He will never be replaced. No matter what governments do, no matter what advances are made in in technology, the power of darkness is defeated. Armageddon has been won when Jesus said, it is finished. It was finished. So God is ruling the world through a man named Jesus. And Jesus said, as the Father sent me into the world, so I send you. So we are called to do exactly what Jesus did. Jesus actually said, greater things will you do because I go to the Father. Jesus has called us to follow in his shoes. He calls us to take up his cross, to take up our cross and to follow him because that is how we exercise the power of Jesus on the earth today by obedient suffering. That doesn't mean that everything you do is going to be miserable or that everything you're going to do uh, is going to be suffering. And and in a way, um, it's like our suffering becomes not suffering. Uh, uh, Torben Sondergaard is a pastor who uh, went to jail here in the United States, even though he he was uh, from the Czech Republic, uh, I believe it was, or from Denmark, um, he came here to do missionary work and was uh, put in prison for no reason, absolutely no reason. There still is no reason given for why he was in prison for over a year here in the United States. Uh, the, immigra- the immigration office put him in prison for over a year. And, uh, you know, he says after he was finally released, um, he said that, yes, it was scary, it was traumatizing, but he also misses it misses being in prison, because when he was in prison, Jesus was with him. Uh, Part of how we demonstrate the victory of Jesus over darkness is that we endure the temptations of evil without collapsing. That's why not giving into temptation is so important. Deliverance is awesome. It's awesome. Mercy is awesome. Forgiveness is awesome, and everyone needs it. Grace, everyone needs it, 100%. But it's still better not to give into temptation than to give into it and then find mercy. You know, better to find mercy than not at all, but it's even better not to sin. And of course, you know, everybody does sin. We all need grace and mercy. I'm not trying to in any way set up this kind of holier than thou or, uh, you know, sinless perfection kind of stuff. I'm just saying that we, um, obedience in faith is the power of the kingdom of God. And uh, it should be our goal to live a holy and pure life. And of course, you know, the Apostle Paul says that this, you know, the whole holiness, the definition of a holy and pure life is love. He said, I can speak with the tongues of men and angels. I can give my body to be burned. I can give all my possessions to the poor. But if I have love, I am nothing. And Jesus said, greater love is no man than this. And he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus took up his cross and obeyed his father And when we do the same, the power of God is released, which is why the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So, should we fear the future? Should we fear Armageddon? No, we should not. Armageddon is already won. What we should fear is failing to fulfill our calling as God's image bearers on the earth. Because if we don't exercise the authority God granted to us, it will be exercised through up the power of darkness. Doing nothing is not an option. So, you know, I, one of the things that's grieving right now is just the um, moral uh, failures, the scandals that are coming out in stories out of IHOP in Kansas City, the International House of Prayer. And I have zero doubt, zero doubt that, that, that the scandals are uh, because they were targeted by the enemy. 
The enemy hates prayer ministries and he targets them. Some people are afraid to cast out demons because they're afraid of making the devil mad, and that's a fact. And so they don't do anything. But not doing anything, the devil, if the devil is leaving you alone, it's because he's already captured you. As Mike Signorelli says, if you're not on a head on collision, if you're not in a head on collision with the devil, it's because you're running in the same direction. Morris Cirillo said that the devil takes many of our church members by default because we don't do anything. Not because he has the power, but because we don't do anything. And this is a call today to leave behind your fears of Armageddon because Jesus has already won. Be of good cheer. He has already overcome the world. This is a call today to take up your armor, to take up your calling, to to take up your vocation to rule and reign. And for some of you, that means you need to be delivered from addictions right now uh, because you can't rule and reign while you're being ruled over by your addictions. And those addictions can be pornography. Those addictions can be substances, you know, plants, like we talked about. Those, ad- those addictions can even be uh, the occult that we're, uh, we're gaining— um, We're trying to find peace in yoga. We're trying to cleanse our house through smudging, through burning sage. We're trying to um, get good energy or healing vibes from uh, energy healers or crystals or those kinds of things. Um, These are all uh, compromises that the devil is using to try to give us, just like he said to Jesus, I'll give you all of this. We're trying to get things like peace, like power, like healing from things that are not God, and thus we're giving over authority in our lives to the devil. We can't begin to exercise authority out there while we're in bondage here. I mean, that's not to say that you as a Christian can't cast out a demon uh, while you have a demon. You can, but you will probably find some real difficulty in that process and some serious kickback. And besides, if you, if you need deliverance yourself, that is the first place you should attend to. Because... Um, you know, even the American government was designed to be self-government. And in that way, I think the American government uh, is consistent with biblical principles that God calls every human being to their own self-government. And if we govern ourselves well, in a way, it doesn't matter what kind of structure we have as a nation. The, go- the nation will function well because the people are governing themselves well. And you are called to take up that authority over yourself. So if you need deliverance today, I want to pray for you. You may also be dominated by negative thoughts, by self-pity, by depression, by anger, by suicidal thoughts. These things will steal the life from you so that you um, will not be fruitful for the kingdom of God. You need to understand that the devil hates your guts, and he has. He pays a lot of attention to you. He knows you well. He doesn't know everything. God knows you more than anybody and anything ever will. But Satan and his kingdom still studies you because they're trying to find a way into your life to usurp your power. They hate your guts, and they want to uh, derail your life. They come to steal, kill, and destroy. So you need to understand that there is something always trying to sabotage your destiny. So I want to pray for you. So Jesus, I thank you for what you're making clearer and clearer in my life, Lord. Something I've always believed, but now I just see it so much clearer. That you have called us to do great things. And you have uh, granted to us the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish those things. So I just declare freedom. I prophesy freedom for every person watching and listening right now. God has not made you for bondage. God has not made you for depression. God has not made you to be enslaved to your passions. God has made you for freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So don't be subject, again, to a yoke of slavery. If you have never given your life to Jesus, know right now you cannot overcome Satan on your own. You are defeated outside of Christ. Your only answer is to say, Jesus, save me. You can't clean up your life. You can't, um, this isn't about finding, uh, living a holy life isn't about making God love us. God already loves us while we were still sinners. Living a holy life is about learning to become who God made us to be so his power can come through us. The image bearers that he created us to be. You were made to bear the image of Christ. 
So holiness is about learning to become like him. So Lord, right now today, and I want you to pray this with me, we renounce in the name of Jesus the devil and all of his works. We renounce our addictions. We renounce the things that we lean on rather than you, uh, even uh, pills, even something like aspirin that we treat it like our Savior, Lord. We repent of those things, of medications that we lean on to give us joy when they can't give us joy. Lord, we repent of believing that these pills are saving our lives. We repent of believing even that surgery is saving our lives. Our times are in your hands, Jesus. That's what we confess today. Lord, we repent of hoping in things like crystals and uh, sage to give us peace or to purify our house. Lord, we acknowledge today that that was a lie that we believed and we repent of it today. And if you've got any of that stuff in your house, you need to burn it. You need to get rid of it now. Lord, we repent of trying to find pleasure, trying to find nurture, trying to find comfort, acceptance, self-esteem in pornography and illicit sexual relationships. We repent of those things now, and we give our lives to you afresh, Lord. We ask that you'd shine your light on us and that you would expose the deeds of darkness in our lives, Lord, that you would expose the lies that we believe so we can be set free from them. We bring ourselves into your light right now. Lord, would you activate us for the sake of your kingdom today, in Jesus' name. Lord, we repent of selfishness, believing that seeking our own uh, needs first, that that um, that we are the ones that have to care for ourselves. Lord, we repent of not believing in your Father's heart. We repent of uh, not trusting you today. And Lord, come in, fill us cleanse us. I pray for every person listening right now. Be filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. I declare to you that you were made to be in charge of your life in the sense of uh, you decide what you will eat and what you will drink. You decide where you will go and what you will say. I command every voice in your head leading you to swear, every voice in your head leading you to lie, every voice in your head telling you to self-harm or to commit suicide. I command every single one of those voices to go right now in the name of Jesus. I break their power. Go right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I come against every uh, voice of the accuser telling you that you're not good enough for love. I just declare that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And if you are feeling guilty and sh uh, shame today because of something you did in the past, uh, that the devil is saying, God doesn't love you. You're an adulterer. You're, um, you're a murderer. Uh, you're a liar. Just say, you're right. I am guilty of those things. I plead the blood of Jesus. That is the best way and the only way to find peace. Plead the blood of Jesus. It's true. We brought curses on ourselves through our sin. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord because he made him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became a curse for us. All those curses are laid on Jesus. Jesus was hung naked on a tree because of our sin. So we put all of our curses on him, and we thank you, Jesus, for taking it away, and we plead your blood, Lord, for all of our sins. And Jesus, I just ask right now that you would ignite every person watching, every person listening. Receive the Holy Spirit right now. God has called you to bring order into your life. God has called you to bring peace and joy into your home. God has called you to start a prayer ministry. God has called you to preach the gospel. God has called you to be a faithful servant of prayer in your prayer closet. God has called you to join hands with other people and to begin to pray. God has called you to forgive and to reconcile. God has called you to pray for those who have hurt you, those who are persecuting you, those who divorced you, those who betrayed you. God is calling you to pray, pray for them because while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And while they were still sinners, Christ died for them. And Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you cannot be forgiven. So he's calling you right now to forgiveness and reconciliation. He's calling you to turn off the television, to stop watching the news and begin to pray. Ask God to open heaven over your country, over your state, 
over your nation, over your family, over your home, over your life. He's asking you to begin to petition heaven to open the doors. Why does he why do you have to do that? If doesn't God just do what he wants to do? No. The earth he has given to the sons of men. You are a portal for heaven. And if you go if you don't open up and begin to call down heaven through your life, it doesn't come through your life because that's the way God set it up. Not because God can't do it, but because that's the way he set it up. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The earth he has given to the sons of men. So unless you begin to pray, unless you begin to say yes to Jesus, unless you begin to become a conduit of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is, limit, the Holy Spirit is limited in what he will do on the earth. Not because he is limited in power, but because this is the way he's chosen to set up the world. So I just um, ask that the Holy Spirit would help you to be obedient, to begin to walk. And some of you, you don't know what to do. Just take that first step. For some of you, that first step is going to be to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, to renounce the devil with your mouth, and to confess with your mouth that from this day forward, my life belongs to you, Jesus. And then it's to get baptized. And those, those are your first steps. And for others, it's throwing away your nicotine. It's, it's pouring out the, the beer bottles, the wine bottles. It's getting rid of the occult items in your house. They're good luck, good luck charms. It's giving money to somebody, um, you know, doing the opposite of whatever that idol has been telling you to do. If your idol has been telling you to collect money, give money. If your idol has been telling you to buckle down, don't do anything because it's very dangerous out there, you know, that your fear is telling you to hide, do the opposite. Do the opposite of what that fear is telling you to do. This is part of how we renounce uh, the devil and we can begin to walk toward Jesus. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So Jesus, I thank you for setting people free today and myself included, Lord. Uh, this podcast itself is part of my um, rebellion against the fear of man. I know that people come against me. I know that people disagree with me. I know that people don't like some of the things that I say. And Lord, I just repent for being afraid of them. And uh, Lord, I renounce that fear of man, and I command the fear of man to leave my life in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that, uh, that I don't have to get all the right answers in order for you to love me. And I thank you that the person on the other side of the screen, that every person there, that you don't have to get everything right in order for God to love you. Our passion to get things right is so that we might be free, not so that God might love us. I thank you, Jesus, that while we were still sinners, you died for us. So we thank you for that freedom. But Lord, breathe on us now the breath of the Holy Spirit. Open heaven over our hearts, over our lives, over our minds, and begin to pour yourself out on us. Let your prophecy come through us, Lord. Let our sons and our daughters prophesy, and our old men dream dreams, and our young men see visions. Thank you, Lord God, for the power that you're pouring out. Thank you that you have not left us or forsaken us, and you will not abandon us. I thank you, Lord, that the best is yet to come, that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. If this has blessed you today, leave a fire emoji, leave a comment, like it, subscribe, share it with somebody, and I'll see you again next time. God bless you. Come on, let's go bring revival to the earth. God is not up, upstairs just kind of waiting to someday where he feels like he's in the mood to bring revival. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on me to say, yes, Lord, bring it here. Come through me. I'm ready. I will do it. God bless you.